In this way, I desire to greet the boys progressive league at their meeting at the Hotel Manhattan. I feel that the progressive party should appeal peculiarly to the young men and therefore to the boys who are to be the next generation of voters. The principles for which we stand are the principles of fair play and a square deal for every man and every woman in the United States. A square deal politically, a square deal in matters social and industrial. I wish to see you boys join the progressive party and act in that party and as good citizens in the same way I'd expect any one of you to act in a football game. In other words, don't flinch, don't fall, and hit the line hard. Now, this statement to Mr. Archibald represents but part of the truth. Mr. Bliss did have real and great influence with him. I respected him and admired him. I should have paid heed to any request or suggestion he made, would have carefully considered it, and would have earnestly desired to do it, to adopt it, if I honorably could. But it is perfectly true that neither Mr. Bliss nor any other human being ever had any influence over me so far as concerned getting me to abandon the prosecution of any corporation or any individual engaged in wrongdoing. To this extent, Mr. Archibald's testimony is entirely true. And I call your attention to the fact that Mr. Archibald and Mr. Penrose come forward to testify against me only because at the moment I am heading the progressive movement. Were I a private citizen, it wouldn't enter their heads to make any assault on me. They dislike me, I grant you. And the longer I live, the greater cause I shall give them to dislike me. But that isn't the fundamental motive that influences them. The fundamental motive that induces them to act as they have acted in this manner is not merely that they dislike me, but far more because they dread you. They dread you, the people. You and those like you who make up the people of the United States. They know that their time has come if once the people obtain real power. We stand for the rights of the people. We stand for the rights of the wage, work, wage worker. We stand for his right to a living wage. We stand for the right and duty of the government to limit the hours of women in industry, to abolish child labor, to shape the conditions of life and living so that the average wage worker shall be able so to lead his own life and so to support his wife and his children that these children shall grow up into men and women fit for the exacting duties of American citizenship. The big trust magnate of the type of Mr. Archibald the big politician of the old boss type, so well represented by Mr. Penrose, stand against the people. They object to the government, to government being used primarily in the interest of the people themselves. Naturally, 
they will do all they can to break down the only real enemies that they have and the only real champions. In this contest, we have a right to appeal to all honest men to support us, without regard to what their political affiliations may have been in the past. The powers that pray are united against us. The powers that pray pay no heed to a question of partisanship in this contest. Some of them may individually prefer Mr. Wilson to Mr. Taft. Others may prefer Mr. Taft to Mr. Wilson. But the preference for either is tepid compared to the intensity of their animosity toward us and their willingness to stand by either of the other two candidates or by anyone else if only they can beat the progressive party. The reason is evident. These men the big bosses of the political field, the beneficiaries of privilege in the field of industry, the men who represent that sinister alliance between crooked politics and crooked business, which has done more than anything else for the corruption of American life, are united as one man against the genuine rule of the people themselves. The privileged classes, the representatives of special privilege, of special interests, can always make terms with a boss or bosses. They can make terms with the bosses who dominate the Republican Party. They can make terms with the bosses who dominate the Democratic Party. But they can't make terms with the people. They can't make terms with the men who honestly and genuinely represent the popular will. The attitude of our opponents has been well shown by the alliance between Messrs. Penrose and Archibald. You may remember that the other day, Senator Penrose of Pennsylvania and Mr. Archbold of the Standard Oil Company appeared before a Senate committee to testify against me. That is, nominally, they were to testify against me. Really, they were testifying against Mr. Cornelius Bliss, who is dead. Mr. Bliss was the, sec was the treasurer of the Republican National Committee during the lifetime of President McKinley, and he continued in that position until, until after 1904, when I ran for president. He lived for seven years after the events of, as to which these two men have testified. Our prime concern is that in dealing with the fundamental law of the land, in assuming finally to interpret it and therefore finally to make it, the acts of the course of the court should be subject to and not above the final control of the people as a whole. I deny that the American people have surrendered to any set of men, no matter what their position or their character, the final right to determine those fundamental questions upon which free self-government ultimately depends. People themselves must be the ultimate makers of their own constitution. And where their agents differ in their interpretations of the constitution, the people themselves should be given the chance, after full and deliberate judgment, authoritatively to settle what interpretation it is that their representatives shall thereafter adopt as binding. We do not question the general honesty of the court. But in applying to present-day social conditions the general prohibitions that were intended originally as safeguards to the citizen against the arbitrary power of government in the hands of caste and privilege, these prohibitions have been turned by the courts from safeguards against political and social privilege into barriers against political and social justice and advancement. 
Our purpose is not to impugn the courts, but to emancipate them from a position where they stand in the way of social justice, and to emancipate the people in an orderly way from the iniquity of enforced submission to a doctrine which would turn constitutional provisions which were intended to favor social justice and advancement into prohibitions against such justice and advancement. In the last 20 years, an increasing percentage of our people have come to depend on industry for their livelihood, so that today the wage workers in industry rank in importance side by side with the tillers of the soil. As a people, we cannot afford to let any group of citizens or any individual citizen live or labor under conditions which are injurious to the common welfare. Industry, therefore, must submit to such public regulation as will make it a means of life and health, not of death or inefficiency. We must protect the crushable elements at the base of our present industrial structure. We stand for a living wage. Wages are subnormal if they fail to provide a living for those who devote their time and energy to industrial occupations. The monetary equivalent of a living wage varies according to local conditions, must, but must include enough to secure the elements of a normal standard of living, a standard high enough to make morality possible, to provide for education and recreation, to care for immature members of the family, to maintain the family during periods of sickness, and to permit a reasonable saving for old age. Hours are excessive if they fail to afford the worker sufficient time to recuperate and return to his work thoroughly refreshed. We hold the night work of labor in women, of, and that the night labor of women and children is abnormal and should be prohibited. We hold that the employment of women over 48 hours per week is abnormal and should be prohibited. We hold that the seven day working week is abnormal, and we hold that one day of rest in seven should be provided by law. We hold that the continuous industries operating 24 hours out of 24 are abnormal, where because of public necessity or for technical reasons, such as molten metal, the 24 hours must be divided into two shifts of 12 hours. Political parties exist to secure responsible government and to execute the will of the people. From these great tasks, both of the old parties have turned aside. Instead of instruments to promote the general welfare, they have become the tools of corrupt interests which use them impartially to serve their selfish purposes. Behind the ostensible government sits enthroned an invisible government, owing no allegiance and acknowledging no responsibility to the people. To destroy this invisible government, to dissolve the unholy alliance between corrupt business and corrupt politics, is the first task of the statesmanship of the day. Unhampered by tradition, uncorrupted by power, undismayed by the magnitude of the task, the new body offers itself as the instrument of the people to sweep away old abuses to build a new and nobler commonwealth. This declaration is our covenant with the people, and we hereby bind the party and its candidates in state and nation to the pledges made her herein. With all my heart and soul, with every particle of high purpose that is in me, I pledge you my word to do everything I can, to put every particle of courage, of common sense, and of strength that I have at your disposal, and to endeavor so far as strength is given me to live up to the obligations you have put upon me, and to endeavor to carry out in the interests of our whole people the policies to which you have today solemnly dedicated yourselves in the name of the millions of men and women for whom you speak. Surely there never was a fight better worth making than the one in which we are engaged. It little matters what befalls any one of us who for the time being stand in the forefront of the battle. I hope we shall win, and I believe that if we can wake the people to what the fight really means, we shall win. But win or lose, we shall not fall. Whatever fate may at the moment overtake any of us, the movement itself will not stop. Our cause is based on the eternal principles of righteousness, and even though we who now lead may for the time fail, the end the cause itself shall run. Six weeks ago, here in Chicago, I spoke to the honest representatives of a convention which was not dominated by honest men. 
a convention wherein sat, alas, a majority of men who, with sneering indifference to every principle of right, so acted as to bring to a shameful end the body which had been founded over half a century ago by men in whose souls burned the fire of lofty endeavor. Now do you men who in your turn have come together to spend and be spent in the endless crusade against Rome, do you who face the future resolute and confident, do you who strive in a spirit of brotherhood for the betterment of our nation, do you who gird yourselves for this great new fight in the never-ending warfare for the good of humankind, the big bosses of the political field, the beneficiaries of privilege in the field of industry, the men who represent that sinister alliance between crooked politics and crooked business, which has done more than anything else for the corruption of American life, are united as one man against the genuine rule of the people themselves. The privileged classes, the representatives of special privilege, of special interests, can always make terms with a boss or bosses. They can make terms with the bosses who dominate the Republican Party. They can make terms with the bosses who dominate the Democratic Party. But they can't make terms with the people. They can't make terms with the men who honestly and genuinely represent the popular will. The difference between Mr. Wilson and myself is fundamental. The other day in a speech at Sioux Falls, Mr. Wilson stated his position when he said that the history of government, the history of liberty, was the history of the limitations of governmental power. This is true as an academic statement of history in the past. It is not true as a statement affecting the present. It is true of the history of medieval Europe. It is not true of the history of 20th century America. In the days when all governmental power existed exclusively in the king or in the baronage, and when the people had no shred of that power in their own hands, then it undoubtedly was true that the history of liberty was the history of the limitation of the governmental power of the outsiders who possessed that power. But today the people have actually or potentially the entire governmental power. It is theirs to use and to exercise if they choose to use and to exercise it. It offers the only adequate instrument with which they can work for the betterment, for the uplifting of the masses of our people. The liberty of which Mr. Wilson speaks today means merely the liberty of some great trust magnate to do that which he is not entitled to do. It means merely the liberty of some factory owner to work haggard women over hours for underpay and himself to pocket the proceeds. It means the liberty of the factory owner who crowds his operatives into some crazy death trap on a top floor where if fire starts, the slaughter is immense. It means the liberty of the big factory owner who is conscienceless and unscrupulous to work his men and women under conditions which eat into their lives like a nasset. It means the liberty of even less conscientious factory owners to make their money out of the toil, the labor of little children. Men of this stamp are the men whose liberty would be preserved by Mr. Wilson. Men of this stamp 
of the men whose liberty would be preserved by the limitation of governmental power. We propose, on the contrary, to extend governmental power in order to secure the liberty of the wage workers, of the men and women who toil in industry, to save the liberty of the oppressed from the oppressor. The great fundamental issue now before our people can be stated briefly. It is, are the American people fit to govern themselves, to rule themselves, to control themselves? I believe they are. My opponents do not. I believe in the right of the people to rule. I believe that the majority of the plain people of the United States will, day in and day out, make fewer mistakes in governing themselves than any smaller class or body of men, no matter what their training, will make in trying to govern them. I believe again that the American people are, as a whole, capable of self-control and of learning by their mistakes. Our opponents pay lip loyalty to this doctrine, but they show their real beliefs by the way in which they champion every device to make the nominal rule of the people a sham. I am not leading this fight as a matter of aesthetic pleasure. I am leading because somebody must lead or else the fight would not be made at all. I prefer to work with moderate, with rational conservatives, provided only that they do in good faith strive forward toward the light. But when they halt and turn their backs to the light, sit with the scorners on the seats of reaction, then I must part company with them. We, the people, cannot turn back. Our aim must be steady, wise promise. It would be well if our people would study the history of a sister republic. All the woes of France for a century and a quarter have been due to the folly of her people in splitting into the two camps of unreasonable conservatism and unreasonable radicalism. Had pre-revolutionary France listened to men like Turgot and backed them up, all would have gone well. But the beneficiaries of privilege, the Bourbon reactionaries, the short-sighted ultra-conservatives, turned down to a go, and then found that instead of him they had obtained Robespierre. They gained 20 years' freedom from all restraint and reform at the cost of the whirlwind of the Red Terror, and in their turn the unbridled extremists of the terror induced a blind reaction. And so, with convulsion and oscillation from one extreme to another, with alternations of violent radicalism and violent bourbonism, the French people went through misery toward a shattered goal. May we profit by the experiences of our brother Republicans across the water and go forward steadily avoiding all wild extremes. And may our ultra-conservatives remember that the rule of the Bourbons brought on the revolution. And may our would-be revolutionaries remember that no Bourbon was ever such a dangerous enemy of the people and of freedom as the professed friend of both Robespierre. There is no danger of a revolution in this country, but there is grave discontent and unrest, and in order to remove them there is need of all the wisdom and probity and deep-seated faith in and purpose to uplift humanity we have at our command. Friends, our task as Americans is to strive for social and industrial justice achieved through the genuine rule of the people. This is our end, our purpose. The methods for achieving the end are merely expedients to be finally accepted or rejected according as actual experience shows that they work well or ill. But in our hearts we must have this lofty purpose and we must strive for it in all earnestness and sincerity or our work will come to nothing. In order to succeed, we need leaders of inspired idealism, leaders to whom are granted great visions, who dream greatly and strive to make their dreams come true, who can kindle the people with the fire from their own burning souls. The leader for the time being, whoever he may be, is but an instrument to be used until broken and then to be cast aside. And if he is worth his salt, he will care no more when he is broken than a soldier cares where he is sent, where his life is profit, in order that the victory may be won. In the long fight for righteousness, the watchword for all of us is spend of our people is vitally and intimately concerned with the welfare of the farmer. The Country Life Commission should be revived with greatly increased power. Its abandonment was a severe blow to the interests of our nation. 
for the welfare of the farmer is a basic need of this nation. It is the men from the farms who in the past have taken the lead in every great movement within our country, whether in time of war or in time of peace. It is well to have our cities prosper, but it is not well if they prosper at the expense of the country. In this movement, the lead must be taken by the farmers themselves. But our people as a whole, through their governmental agencies, should back them up. Everything possible should be done for the better economic condition of the farmer, and also to increase the social value of the life of the farmer's wife and their children, no less than of the farmer himself. The burdens of labor and loneliness bear heavily on the women in the country. Their welfare should be the especial concern of all of us. Everything possible should be done to make life in the country profitable so as to be attractive from an economic standpoint, and there should be just the same chance to live as full, as well-rounded, and as useful lives in the country as in the city. The government must cooperate with the farmer to make the farm more productive. There must be no skinning of the soil. The farm should be left for the farmer's son, to the farmer's son, in better and not worse condition because of its cultivation. Moreover, every invention and improvement, every discovery and economy should be at the service of the farmer in the work of production. And in addition, he should be helped to cooperate in business fashion with his fellows so that the money paid to the consumer for the product of the soil shall to as large a degree as possible, go into the pockets of the man who raised that product from the soil. So long as the farmer leaves cooperative, cooperative activities with their profit sharing to the city man of business, so long will the foundations of wealth be undermined and the comforts of enlightenment be impossible in the country community. The present condition of living cannot be accepted as satisfactory. There are too many who do not prosper enough, and of the few who prosper greatly, there are certainly some whose prosperity does not mean welfare for the country. Rational progressives, no matter how radical, are well aware that nothing the government can do will make some men prosper, and we heartily approve the prosperity, no matter how great, of any man if it comes because of his rendering service to the community. But we wish so to shape conditions that a greater number of the small men in business, in business, the decent, respectable, industrious, and energetic men who conduct small businesses, who are retail traders, who run small sh stores and shops, shall be able to succeed, and so that the big man who is dishonest shall not be allowed to succeed at all. Our aim is to control business, not to strangle it. And above all, not to continue the policy of make-believe strangle towards big concerns that do evil, and constant menace toward both big and little concerns that do well. Our aim is to promote prosperity and then to see that prosperity is passed around, that there is a proper division of prosperity. We wish to control big business, among other reasons, so that we may secure good wages for the wage workers, as well as reasonable prices for the consumer. We will not submit to the prosperity that, that is obtained by lowering the wages of working men and charging an excessive price to the consumer. Nor to that... There is no body of our people whose interests are more inextricably interwoven with the interests of all the people, and here's the case with the farmers. The Country Life Commission should be revived with greatly increased powers. Its abandonment was a severe blow, blow to the interests of our people. The welfare of the farmer is a basic need of this nation. It is the men from the farm who in the past have taken the lead in every great movement within this nation, whether in time of war or in time of peace. It is well to have our cities prosper, but it is not well if they prosper at the expense of the country. In this movement, the lead must be taken by the farmer themselves. But our people as a whole, through their governmental agencies, should back the farmers. Everything possible should be done to better the economic condition of the farmer, and also to increase the social value of the life of the farmer, the farmer's wife, and their children. The burdens of labor and loneliness bear heavily on the women in the country. Their welfare should be the especial concern of all of us. 
everything possible should be done to make life in the country profitable so as to be attractive from the economic standpoint. And there should be just the same chance to live as full, as well-rounded, and as highly useful lives in the country as in the city. The government must cooperate with the farmer to make the farm more productive. There must be no skinning of the soil. The farm should be left to the farmer's son in better and not worse condition because of its cultivation. Moreover, every invention and improvement, every discovery and economy should be at the service of the farmer in the work of production. And in addition, he should be helped to cooperate in business fashion with his fellows, so that the money paid by the consumer for the product of the soil shall, to as large a degree as possible, go into the pockets of the man who raised that product in the soil. So long as the farmer leaves cooperative activities with their profit sharing to the city man of business, so long will the foundations of wealth be undermined and the comforts of enlightenment be impossible in the country communities. The present conditions of business cannot be accepted as satisfactory. There are too many who do not prosper enough. And of the few who prosper greatly, there are certainly some whose prosperity does not mean well for the country. Rational progressives, no matter how radical, are well aware that nothing the government can do will make some men prosper. And we heartily approve the prosperity, no matter how great, of any man if it comes as an incident to rendering service to the community. But we wish to shape conditions so that a greater number of the small men in business, the decent, respectable, industrious and energetic men who conduct small businesses, who are retail traders, who run small stores and shops, shall be able to succeed. And so that the big man who is dishonest shall not be allowed to succeed at all. Our aim is to control business, not to strangle it. And above all, not to continue a policy of make-believe strangle toward big concerns that do evil and constant menace toward both big and little concerns that do well. Our aim is to promote prosperity and then to see that prosperity is passed around, that there is a proper division of prosperity. We wish to control big business so as to secure, among other things, good wages for the wage workers and reasonable prices for the consumers. We will not submit to the prosperity that is obtained by lowering the wages of working men and charging an excessive price to consumers, nor to that other kind of prosperity obtained by swindling investors or getting unfair advantages over business rivals. We propose to make it worthwhile for our businessmen to develop the most efficient business agencies. But we propose to make these business agencies do complete justice to our whole people. We're against...
cause the sidelight it casts on their own motives and standards of propriety, and incidentally, an unwitting tribute to the attitude of my administration. If you will turn to page 133 of the record, you can get the record, I will say incidentally, from your senator, unless he's a stand-fast senator, in which case you probably can't get it from him. If you will turn to page 133 of the record, you will find where Mr. Archibald says, substantially, Dorcas Abyssinia can show nothing to compare with the treatment administered to the Standard Oil Corporation during the administration of President Roosevelt. In this instance, Mr. Archibald is testifying to what, to what is quite correct. I did administer the Abyssinian treatment to the Standard Oil Corporation while I was president. I administered it because I thought the Standard Oil needed it. And if ever I am president again, and the Standard Oil or any other corporation acts as the Standard Oil then did, I'll administer the Abyssinian treatment to it again. That's why Mr. Archibald and Mr. Penrose are trying to beat me and to beat the progressive party. You may notice that Mr. Archibald doesn't complain that the present administration ever administered the Abyssinian treatment to the Standard Oil Company. Not a bit of it. Mr. Archibald has no fear that either the Democratic or the Republican parties, if successful at the next election, would administer the Abyssinian treatment to the Standard Oil Corporation or to any other of the big law-breaking trusts. Mr. Archibald knows that the Standard Oil could make its peace with could come to an agreement with the men who manage the Republican Party or the men who manage the Democratic Party. But he also knows that he could make no peace with the leaders of the Progressive Party, and he could make no peace with the Progressive Party itself, because it is in very fact the party of the people of the United States. Again, on the next page of the test. In this way, I desire to greet the Boys Progressive League at their meeting at the Hotel Manhattan. I feel that the Progressive Party should appeal peculiarly to the young men and therefore to the boys who are to be the next generation of voters. The principles for which we stand are the principles of fair play and a square deal for every man and every woman in the United States. A square deal politically, a square deal in matters social and industrial. I wish to see you boys Join the progressive party and act in that party and as good citizens in the same way I'd expect any one of you to act in a football game. In other words, don't flinch, don't fall. Civil calls made at San Juan de Santiago, Cuba by Chief Trumpet of Cassie. Of Roosevelt Truck Driver, July 1st, 
Hey! 